Hi, welcome to the second half of fossils, where we're going to examine why the fossils you learned about go out of the rock record, the fossil record. And let's start there and talk about the difference between the rock record and fossil record. Geologically speaking, while they are very similar, they also have important differences. Collectively, the rock record is everything we have on planet Earth that allows scientists to kind of decipher what has happened to the earth over time. So when we talk about the earth, we're referring to not just the earth's body itself, meaning the layers of the earth, the top of the earth, we're also referring to anything that once lived. But that's where things get a bit interesting. So rock record re really refers to rock layers and embedded with rock layers is also a fossil record. The fossil record refers to the ancient organisms that have been captured and preserved in the rock record. In either case, whether it's rock record or fossil record, we have an incomplete snapshot of the Earth's history. And that's important to recognize. And there's some reasons why. Fossils don't typically get preserved. In many cases, they're destroyed or they are uh, buried so deep that they may get changed into a different part of the rock cycle. But really often, most especially vertebrates, have a very low chance of being preserved. So when we find whether it's invertebrates, vertebrates, or trace fossils, we get excited because they tell us so much about the Earth's ancient history. And I also left out plant life. Plant life gives us so much information about what was going on environmentally for the climate at the time when organisms lived. And so if there's anything similar to plant life, for example, seagrasses that we might see in an ocean, that can also give us information that's valuable. So what is an extinction event? These represent the termination of a species where at least the last of the living organisms go belly up. For practical terms, that means they go extinct. They cannot reproduce. So more than 99% of all living organisms that have existed throughout all of geologic time have gone extinct. And you might go, well, wow. <laughs> yeah, if you start thinking about it, it's a bit sobering. That also means that humans have gone extinct. Species of various humans have gone extinct. Something to think about as we start recognizing that extinctions have affected basically all life forms on the planet throughout geologic time. So there are different types of extinctions, and we're going to start with one of the most common, which is called a background extinction. These represent small numbers of, of organisms that could be plants, microscopic life, macroscopic, which is stuff you can see with, without a microscope, that could be vertebrates, invertebrates, but essentially the small group of species normally can go extinct over time, over a period of geologic time that is, as a result of competition and evolution in organisms of that same species group. So a good one would be sauropods. Most of them went extinct, not all, but the largest ones that roamed the planet at the end of the Jurassic period. So at the time the dinosaurs lived, that's called the Mesozoic era, meso referring to middle. So there's a Triassic, a middle uh, layer, and then there's the Cretaceous and Jurassic sits in the middle. So there's three eras of time. There's Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. Paleo referring to ancient, Ceno referring, referring to newer, Mesos right smack in the middle. And Mesozoic's nicely divided into those three periods with Jurassic being right in the middle. Well, these sauropods, why did they go extinct? Was there something that happened that limited their food resource or did the climate change in such a way that could have impacted them? Was there some type of a, an animal that was in more competition for the same resources that they had. These are all things that could contribute to background extinction for a group of species that share, that share the same geologic time frame and basically the same environment at that point in geologic time. When we're thinking about background extinctions, we have to talk a little bit about evolution. So sometimes it's easy to get in the thought that survival of the fittest is the only way that organisms survived. 
And I'd like to talk about that for a bit because sometimes it that, that is the case, oftentimes actually. So they may be better adapted. It doesn't mean they're just necessarily the strongest. And that's the point I want to make. Survival of the fittest refers to whatever organisms can adapt in such a way that they could survive and have the opportunity to reproduce. So that brings us into an important topic of sexual reproduction or specifically sexual fitness, which refers to the ability of an organism to simply be able to reproduce. So let's say that all of a sudden a group of brown roaches could no longer reproduce like they have no ability to do that and let's just hypothetically say they're purple ones that live at the same time so the purple ones in today's world probably wouldn't be as fit in terms of survival of the fittest because they wouldn't blend in or camouflage with their environments very well but now the purple ones can survive because they can simply reproduce Sometimes you have to consider that it could be something as obvious as that that could lead to a background extinction. And survival of the fittest really has to connect to that other piece, can they reproduce or not? Because when a species is no longer able to reproduce, they're going to fizzle out, obviously, when the last one goes extinct. So humans right now, we've kind of put our finger on background extinctions in a good way with the best of intentions to try to stop some of these background extinctions from happening with organisms that are alive today through captive breeding programs, other means to try to prevent organisms from going extinct. That is though only as successful as a breeding program would allow. So in nature, we don't have captive breeding programs out in the wild. And that's why many organisms can go extinct naturally. So we're gonna examine all five of the mass extinction events that scientists recognize currently as already have happened. That's the key word. Because you might be going, well, I thought we were in a mass extinction event right now. We'll get to that. But these are ones that have concluded that have already happened in terms of being recognized. That brings us to recognizing the geologic time scale. So in your book, you have a geologic time scale that keeps reappearing in your chapters because it's significantly important. If you decide to take historical geology, which you will have had to take this class in order to do so, you will need to know the geologic time scale in terms of when were the eras, when were the eons, when were the geologic periods that separated them, and in terms of the Cenozoic era, when were the epochs that occurred? So there are just two geologic eons. These are the biggest groups of geologic time on that geologic time scale. And it's either the Precambrian or the Phanerozoic. And Precambrian constitutes 88% of all geologic time. So you might go, but it's really tiny off the time scale. Yep, because we don't have a huge amount of rock record except for probably the Protozoic. We have quite a bit and some from the Archean very, 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 very limited in any Hadean rocks. And you have to ask why. So I want you to think about that question. Why don't we have this rock record? Why is the stuff that's so old, that's from 4.0 billion years and back, why don't we not have that to the beginning of the Earth's history? But we do have quite a bit for the last Eon, which is the Phanerozoic, and it's currently what we're in now. So the Phanerozoic is again divided into three eras, eras being the next largest category of time from an eon, and there are three of them in the Phanerozoic. There is the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic, and then subsequently this is subdivided into periods. Periods are then subdivided into another smaller unit of time called epochs. And even epochs are divided into the tiniest increment of time on the geologic time scale known as an age. So when you start getting into ages, they're very, very short in duration. And they usually have monster long names because they're named after something usually local in the area or some important uh, indigenous type of term. But you need to know that each of these time slots are important to how we delineate mass extinction events on the planet. So as we journey through the five different mass extinction events, I want you to keep a few things in mind. You'll see, for example, the Ordovician-Solarian, M-E-E, -E, mass extinction event. What does that really mean? 
So the Ordovician period ended around 444 million years ago, and subsequently the Silurian period started at the same time the Ordovician ended. It's easy to want to think that all extinctions were boom, instantaneous. They don't work that way. The fossil record tells us that many extinctions are not just punctuated. Then there is such a thing as punctuated equilibrium. That's a type of evolution. But we do see that most extinctions happen over a stretch of time. The length of that time can vary on a number of factors, such as environmental or climate conditions. If there was a distinctive reason why a group of species just all went extinct very close in proximity to each other in terms of geologic time. So as we go through all of these, I want you to keep that in mind. Also, make note if one of these events represents the top three mass extinction events in which number they slot they've been given, which honor first, second, or third place. <laughs> And I also want you to pay attention to the percentage of organisms that went belly up. What happened? Was it predominantly marine life? Was it terrestrial life? Was it both? Was it plant life? What happened? Then last but not least, was there a known reason scientists can attribute the mass extinction to? So in the case of the Ordovician and Silurian, it ranks as the second largest mass extinction event on the planet. Marine life was predominantly impacted. So you have to scroll back the clock and think about what was going on at that time. We were really diversified by the end of the Ordovician in terms of marine life. By then, we had our phylums intact, all for kingdom animalia. But we didn't during the Cambrian. We got most of them, but not all. But we certainly did by the end of the Ordovician. We really hadn't begun a big journey on land yet with life on land. So most everything is restricted to the ocean. And you're, because we just didn't see the evolution in the, the fossil record to suggest that life was rampant on land at all. So up to 85% of marine organisms went extinct at the end of this mass extinction event. Scientists can attribute several major things here. We started to see a big time ice age at the end of the Ordovician. Well, when you have an ice age, that shrinks the amount of global uh, ocean water available. So the oceans were on land. There's a mass, uh, or should I say a large transgressive sequence, which you'll learn about very soon in this class. Transgressions means sea level on land. And as that ice age occurred, sea level dramatically dropped off the continent. So if your marine life is really taking root on the types of environments they would live in, typically shallower marine environments, certainly less than 800 feet, but probably most of them in two, three, 400 feet of water, then these animals are gonna be severely impacted when their habitat is gone. In fact, they're going to get buried and they're going to die off, which is exactly what scientists believe happened. That climate shift to an ice age didn't just magically happen. So we know climate change was a big part of that. So granted, humans were not alive at this time, far from it. I mean, it's gonna be many hundreds of millions of years before we come into the equation. So what could have contributed to that? There's a whole set of circumstances by which you would want to investigate as to what led to these environmental conditions and stuff that scientists are trying to unravel on a regular basis. We know the answers to some of these questions. We don't know them to all. So now we're to the late Devonian mass extinction event. You're like, but wait, I thought we had two periods involved with each one. Wish it was that nice, clean, and packaged, but we can clearly state that this mass extinction event occurred at the end of the Devonian period. And then, boom, we don't see any of these animals and plants and so forth in the fossil record that go extinct during the late Devonian and the next geologic period referred to as the Mississippian, at least in North America. We may be clear on that because Mississippian and Pennsylvanian are recognized as the Carboniferous, if you look at your geologic time scale in Europe. So in the United States, North America, we had completely different depositional environments for the time frame of the Mississippian versus the time frame of the Pennsylvanian. 
in Europe and other some parts of the world, they had carboniferous type conditions throughout that entire segment of time that we represent as two different geologic periods. That's why in your time scale, you'll see carboniferous, which is referred to as a big C on the geologic time scale when it's abbreviated. So let's talk about that late Devonian mass extinction event. Keep in mind that extinctions don't happen just boom all at once. So right around 359 million years ago, which was the conclusion of the Devonian period, we see a series of fluctuating sea level changes that were important to creating a shift in climate throughout the world. And plant and land animals were impacted severely. And then of course, every time we get a mass extinction event, the ocean critters do not fare very well. Marine life takes a hit. So we can kind of look at the marine rock record as a guide to what's happening globally. And then sometimes more localized, we can see what's happening with our extinction events with land, plants, and animals. What scientists can agree for this particular mass extinction event was, okay, we had a climate change event in conjunction with other environmental stressors that led to this particular mass extinction event. Now we're going to get to our first prize winner of all mass extinction events, which is known as the Great Dying. That's the Permian-Triassic mass extinction event. Why does it cover two geologic periods? It doesn't cover the whole thing, just a tail end of one and the tad beginning of the next one. So the Permian concludes the end of the Paleozoic era. I need you to look at that time scale and take a look that is the last period of that era. So now we're to that Permian Triassic moment of 252-ish million years ago where the great dying occurred. That's an actual name that this mass extinction event is often referred to because 95% of all marine species and 70% of all terrestrial or land species, that's plants and animals alike, went extinct. This is the worst mass extinction event of all geologic time. There is some debate about what caused it. There's some evidence that there was a meteorite collision in a specific part of the world that could have acted much like one we'll learn in a few minutes. And there are evidences of volcanism that occurred from greenhouse gases that immensely produced a change in the environment. So typically when we see some kind of mass extinction event like this, there's multiple causes but they all point towards one thing, climate change. Climate change is a common denominator between most of our top three events of geologic mass extinction episodes. So certainly the case in the Great Dying. Did it happen in just one blip of a moment? No, it took time to do this. So sometimes we want to put things as a definitive death date on animals when we're talking about mass extinction event. It rarely happens that way species-wide. It may happen in an area where you have some uh, unusual geologic event. After the Great Dying, Triassic period is a time of filling those niches that were left behind by all these organisms on land and in the ocean. So we didn't have dinosaurs at the end of the Permian, but we start to evolve them during the Triassic period. Most of the Triassic is a time of when we're gonna have extensive periods of recovery where organisms are trying to find new environments in which to exist, trying to evolve to adapt to those conditions plant life recovering, which also directly correlates to what can live. So we also have a lot of rifting, continental rifting, where continents begin to tear apart during the Triassic on into the early Jurassic. So by the end of the Triassic, we're gonna have our first dinosaurs that we can see in the fossil record. That's important to note because we're gonna see our first big hit to dinosaurs, or what we call non-avian dinosaurs at the end of the Triassic, as well as other life, marine life, plant life, non-dinosaur life, 
But we see that happening right around the 200 million year mark between the Triassic and early, early, early Jurassic. So again, early is the beginning of a geologic period, middle is the middle of a period, and end or late refers to the tail part or the tail end of a geologic period. So we're talking about the tail end of the Triassic, the very beginning of the Jurassic. Again, this was a climate change event. Now this does not rank in the top uh, three, so it's not first, second, or third, but it is one of those fourth and fifth placers, a extinction event, third prize winner. So the first prize winner was the great dying at the end of the Permian, beginning of the Triassic, that being as the worst because it involves dinosaurs. And that's the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction event. So let me address that before the geologic timescale was adjusted in the Cenozoic by the International Commission on Stratigraphy, who outlines what the order is, how long periods are, things of that nature, we used to have a different period that began the Cenozoic known as the tertiary period. Tertiary has now been renamed into two separate periods, Paleogene and Neogene. So the Paleogene, just like we saw with Paleozoic and then Mesozoic and Cenozoic, the Paleogene represents the older of the two Cenozoic periods that represent the beginning time frames of that section of time. This mass extinction event that happened at the end of the Cretaceous is so profound because we lose what are called non-avian dinosaurs. This occurred somewhere right around 66 to 65 million years ago. It affected not just dinosaurs on land, but severely impacted marine life and plant life on land. Multiple causes have contributed to this mass extinction event, but they all point a finger towards climate change. So the Deccan traps in India that you see in the diagram or map below are these massive deposits of basalt, flood basalts at that. So if you think back to the igneous rock layer chapter and I'm a little later in the semester when we get to volcanism, when you have extreme volcanism where we have lots and lots of deposits of lava being uh, deposited on land, some of these more fluidy lava eruptions, like we see in the Deccan Traps, can literally travel for tens of miles away from their source. And if you have hundreds of volcanoes erupting at a similar point in geologic time, you can cover an immense amount of land with deposits one after another. The Deccan Traps are so magnificent in how thick they are. They're not just one volcanic event. They represent millions of years of a deposition. And so that's a really important thing to recognize that we started getting this at the end of the Cretaceous period. Volcanism can contribute mass amounts of change of chemistry into the atmosphere for greenhouse gases. And they can also produce particulate matter that can block sunlight, which can lead to a cooling trend. So just because you have climate warming gases doesn't mean you're automatically going to trigger a global warming. It often does coincide with that. However, in the case of the end of the Cretaceous, we have another known event that was discovered back in the 80s, and it relates to a collision with a massive meteorite, and you see that in the left-hand picture. So the specific nature of the K-PG, so K stands for Cretaceous, it's an abbreviation, and you might wonder, why is it not C? Because we've already used C as an abbreviation for the Carboniferous, if you look at your geologic time scale, and then Cambrian is referred to with a C with a line through it. So Cretaceous means, uh, the prefix means chalk, and uh, Creta is the prefix that's used for Cretaceous, and that's why it's given the letter K. There's an impact crater from a meteorite known as, there's an impact crater that's found in Chicxulub in Mexico, right along the coast of Chicxulub, which is actual city, a location area of Mexico. A six mile wide asteroid meteorite smashed into earth. But what's unique about this is the layer that you see way down here. 
Okay, this one where you see the charred remains here, and right above it you see this whitish, kind of grayish layer, and then you see another charred layer directly above it. This is known as the Cretaceous Paleogene layer. And most of our scientific literature that's predating uh, when the International Commission on Stratigraphy renamed the Cretaceous Tertiary Boundary as the Cretaceous Paleogene Boundary, you'll see it referred to as the KT for tertiary boundary, in case you're doing some research on this layer. But what's so unique about this layer is the iridium in it. Iridium is a rare earth element. Now you can certainly have it come out of volcanoes, but not in concentrations in any volcanic layer that we see on the planet, including the Deccan Traps, that you could have this type of concentration of a rare earth element. That's what makes it rare earth. So to have a layer that's several inches thick, that's incredibly astounding with the percentage made up of iridium. It had to come from an extraterrestrial source. So the layer was found first, and then later a father and a son uh, team were doing some oil explorations and had a hypothesis anyway that there had to be this crater meteorite evidence somewhere that this thing struck Earth and they found it off the coast of Chicxulub, Mexico, while they were doing these studies. And subsequently, this layer is found across the globe. Obviously, the closer to the impact crater, the thicker the layer. So the layer you're looking at here is actually found in Trinidad, Colorado. This is my photo. And you can see it throughout that area. And literally, if you're looking at the layer, it's about this thick. In some places it may be a little thinner, but it's about just two to three inches thick. I mean, it's not very large. But considering how much iridium it has in it, it is a clear boundary marker between the end of the Cretaceous and the beginning of the Paleogene. And why this is so significant is that's a boundary layer. Everything below that layer contains non-avian dinosaurs. Everything above that iridium layer contains no, nada, none, <laughs> no non-avian dinosaurs. So why am I careful to say non-avian? Because birds, avian dinosaurs still exist today. They survived the mass extinction event. There are a couple of species of reptiles that aren't in the dinosauria group, and those would be things like sea turtles. They survive, but all no non-avian dinosaurs. So things like T-Rex, Velociraptor, things like Triceratops, and all of their Cerichian and Ornithician dinosaurs, if you get to historical, you'll learn all about these types of dinosaurs. They went extinct. No fossils have been found of these animals above this iridium layer. So between intense volcanism, which probably impacted the dinosaurs living anyway, we get a, a massive strike by the six mile wide uh, asteroid meteorite that smashes into Earth. You can imagine the immense amount of forest fires, tsunami waves. In fact, there are tsunami waves deposits in Texas from this event. So it's not just iridium, there's other pieces of evidence. It's not just the meteorite crater itself. It's actually all of these pieces of information put together that tell us what happened at the end of the Cretaceous period. Well, that brings us to the sixth mass extinction event. Now, mind you, they're only five recognized by geologists. So what am I talking about? Eventually, I expect the International Commission on Stratigraphy to add another epic to the Cenozoic, and it will be called the Anthropocene. So anthropologists already recognize this, anthro referring to the study of humans. So people who study humans are anthropologists. Now, the extinction rate for the Anthropocene extinction is 100 to 1,000 times higher than what we see as natural background extinction rates. So you're like, oh, well, that's a minor extinction. Let's hope so, but it's not headed in that direction. That's why I can't call it a mass extinction event just yet. I'm just saying it's headed that direction as the Holocene mass extinction event. So if you look at your geologic time scale, the Holocene is the most recent epic on the time scale. So it's at the very top on the Cenozoic in the epic column. Wow, that's a lot of extinctions very, very rapid. 
So the affected groups are not going to surprise you when you start to look at coral reefs, rainforests, mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, fishes, vertebrates. Yep, you're starting to see a uh, trend. Plant life is involved in there too. Why? So why is it so fast in terms of literally hundreds of years and sometimes tens of, of decades? So something's going on. Well, we can look to ancient climate change as a way to help figure this out. So there's something called the PETM that occurred shortly after the mass extinction event known as the Cretaceous uh, Paleogene. So the Paleogene is made up of several epochs, Paleocene, Eocene, Oligocene. And the end of the Paleocene marks a rapid, very, very quick climate warming. And that's referred to as the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum, otherwise known as the PETM. So what does that maximum thermal maximum mean? It means the, a, one of the most fast and intense global warmings in geologic rock record. That's what it means. This significant climbing event occurred right at the marker of around 55.5, million years ago. There were absolutely no polar ice caps at that time, which played a very important role in regulating sunlight, global radiation from the sun. So ice packs help reflect some of that heat back to space. They have a negative albedo effect. So what does that mean? Not a bad thing, not the term negative meaning bad. It means negative in terms of cooling of temperature, where a positive forcing would represent a positive increase in temperature, meaning an increase, just an addition from what's the static uh, equilibrium. So when you have a positive versus a negative, we're simply looking at math. Is it losing temperature or is it gaining temperature? So when you don't have ice packs and other lighter colored uh, surfaces on the planet, more radiation is absorbed, which accelerates the rate of climate change. This is so important to modern day Holocene extinction story. So let's look at this PETM with that in mind. So carbon data from the early Eocene epoch show us that the carbon levels were at a very high level, natural level of a thousand parts per million. What does that really mean? I'm gonna show you as we go through this small climate lesson here. The current global carbon level is around 409 parts per million. Now the industrial revolution puts it around 350 to 360 when we started the industrial revolution. So where did the source of the PETM come from for all of this carbon that was in the atmosphere? Because humans weren't there producing what we call anthropogenic or human-induced caused greenhouse gases. So humans aren't even anywhere in the equation yet. The source came from volcanism and what we call ocean methane clathrates or reservoirs. They're just pockets of frozen methane. And when those melt, they release that methane and methane holds a just a tremendous amount more heat per um, molecule as compared to carbon. So when you get a lot of methane in an atmosphere, that can accelerate climate change very fast. That's one reason that environmentally we regulate things like methane, but not carbon in the United States at least currently. So volcanoes during the Eocene released immense concentrations of carbon into the atmosphere and then methane escaped from these methane clathrates or reservoirs into the atmosphere from the oceans. And this created too much greenhouse gas. Mind you, we had no reflectivity, so we had no albedo that could um, cause us to have a reflection back into the atmosphere or back into outer space to help regulate our climate a little better. This created a massive global warming and a very quick one at that. We're talking like literally over the course of a few millions of years and marketably changed how the ocean temperature went, which killed off a tremendous amount of important ocean microscopic uh, organisms, 
which we kind of use for different things today. They're skeletons anyway, because they're really tiny. They're little diatoms, and a bunch of them died off at that time. But more importantly, what happened to macro life and plant life on Earth? This is the case study you need to take note of. The fossil record shows us something remarkable happened. So we got an explosion of certain types of plants that could endure dry, hot conditions. Things related to beans. Not the most nutritious diet for most animals. Now, I'm not saying there's conclusive evidence that animals shrunk in stature because of a bad diet. There's some evidence for that. That may not have been the only cause, but we know that they were restricted in what they could eat. So things that were grazers like horses, horses really evolved during the Eocene. So we went from having what you would consider maybe not a full size, but close to full size horse today to being dog size. So how could that happen in such a short period of time? It happened because of climate change. So mammal size dramatically reduced during the PETM. That, it should be a take notice moment. How would that translate in today's world where we have over 7 billion humans on the planet that need to feed and have access to food if we were to get so hot and mimic the same conditions of carbon on the planet that existed back in the PETM? Could we sustain that population? Based on what history shows us in the geologic rock record, the answer would be no. So let's take a closer examination of that. So you're going to notice in this graph, let me explain what you're seeing. The black or shorter column represents the current or around the current level of carbon. And then the red or taller uh, bar on the graph there is what you would see if we doubled the amount of carbon concentrations from the Industrial Revolution. Every time we double pre-industrial or right at the Industrial Revolution levels of carbon, we actually increase global mean temperature by one degree Celsius. Now I need you to ponder that for a minute. So every time we're doubling carbon, we're actually increasing meanwhile up uh, Every time we're increasing carbon, doubling it, the pre-industrial, right at that industrial revolution layer or level of carbon, we're increasing global mean temperature by one degree C. That is profound. You need to think about that because there will come a tipping point where the atmosphere cannot absorb any more and we're just going to end up getting like a Venus effect too hot, too quick, and it's going to impact biological life on the planet. We've seen it happen there in the PETM. So let's look at what that translates to. All right, so we see that carbon level at the bottom, which is the pre-industrial revolution level. Then we're going to double that, and we get the current carbon level here, the gray is bar, then you're going to see where the PETM was. Now, I really want you to pay attention to this black bar graph right here. Then I want you to see what happens with the one degree C increase, which would be doubling our pre-industrial revolution carbon by one time, which equates to one degree C. We double that again, we end up with a two degree C increase, and then we hit that a third time. And notice even by a two degree C, we've surpassed the PETM carbon levels and dramatically by the three degree. So somewhere between two and three degrees C is enough to hit that tipping level, which is a scary thing because we already know what happened to mammals when there was a lot fewer of them than there are of humans. So now we have mammals and we have humans and we have a certain amount of plant life on earth. How is that going to work if we hit these levels and have the same kind of global warming event? Not to mention space will be an issue of how are you going to grow enough crops? How are we going to have enough food to sustain life on Earth of all categories? It's a scary, scary thing. So with that in mind, that brings us to understanding how you can make a difference. I'm not asking you 
to say climate change is real. I'm asking you to look at the science. You be the judge on what happened. If you want to research more about the PETM, I would also encourage you to look at sea level rise and start looking at the scientific data that suggests and shows proof of evidence that we are seeing this happen and it's happened in geologic past. We can see sea level go up and down with transgressions and regressions and the rock deposits and the fossil record that shows extinction events have happened. They're real. What can you do to make a difference? Recycle would be the first thing. You may go, that's just kind of cheesy. Well, recycling helps reduce the impact of, for example, smelting of aluminum cans. Smelting comes from rock known as bauxite. And bauxite contains that aluminum and we smelt it or melt it right out of there. And then we blend it with other metals to make an alloy. Aluminum was so rare that it is one of the original metals of the crown jewels. So most of what we have out there that we use for things like cans and other types of aluminum products are alloys. Consider using an electric vehicle that doesn't release nearly the amount of emissions. Consider doing a rideshare program where you're not commuting by yourself in a large city where there's a lot of emissions. Just consider that it's making a small difference. Doing these things can help if we will all chip in and do our share. As we reflect on what you've learned, this was not a, a thing to try to alarm you, but it probably did when you started to learn about what happened to the mammals during the PETM. You're looking at Lake Mead here. I took this shot from an airplane. I was headed out to Nevada for a trip and I had a, a really good shot of Lake Mead. And hopefully Lake Mead will rise with rainfall and not continue to drop to where it's unusable. Lake Mead is a man-made lake, FYI. One of two lakes on the Colorado River, which we'll get to later in the semester when we look at the price of water. But what I want you to see is that white ring represents a bathtub. And the bathtub represents the full of the reservoir when it was built, when they filled it. And this is where it is today. What's happening? So this is a whole nother climate story in itself, but it's something that I think you should ponder big picture wise. How does climate change impact just humans in general? We're seeing it happen in real time with weather disasters, a frequency and intensity. We're seeing fresh water shortages around the globe, including this area right here. What would it mean if we had an event like the PETM or worse in terms of climate change? Subsequently, what if we had another ice age when the earth finally snaps itself back into a climate correction process? Ice ages are just that. They typically occur because of plate movements, orientation of certain um, astronomical uh, situations, and then also because the ocean has absorbed so much carbon that it hits a tipping point and it has to kind of snap itself back into place. The ocean is our reservoir of protection against excessive carbon in particular. In fact, carbon is smashed into, takes by the ocean and consolidates it into rock as we know of limestone. So eventually, <laughs> When it gets so hot that limestone precipitates and we start releasing carbon, that's gonna accelerate climate change. And I just want you to see the, the connection here. Climate change is real and it has affected a majority of our mass extinction events. We know that the fossil record and rock record tell us these events come true, that they have happened. So I mentioned the rock record. How do we know that extinction events happen there besides the fossils? Because we can measure carbon we can measure other types of sediments that are indicators of these climate change events, both cold and warming events. So in conclusion, every action you can make can help with this problem. I'm not gonna say we're gonna reverse it. I sure hope we find the technology to do so, but we're headed towards that one to two degree C increase on planet Earth and with it, in geologic past anyway, there has been significant impacts to life on Earth. That sums it up for now for extinctions. As we move into 
our next part of the semester, you'll be learning about transgressions, regressions, and unconformities. And I want you to think about how that relates to the topics you've learned about in fossils and ancient climate change and extinctions. Thanks. Bye.